You know, we hear a lot of talk in this hour in Christian circles about intercession. And people are saying, oh, let us make intercession for our nation. Let us intercede for one another. Let us pray for one another. But I wonder, have we thoroughly examined this subject to find out the biblical meaning of intercession? Have we thoroughly allowed the Holy Ghost to deal in our lives that we can be used as vessels of intercession? Or is it just another religious cliche in a terminology that we've adopted to make us sound spiritual while all the time we're not even doing the works that God intended, but we're only mouthing the words? You know, here in America, we have a lot of problem with lip service Christianity. Everybody uses the right term because we're an educated people. Everybody uses the right phrases which sound as though they know what they're doing. But nobody is doing anything and no one is standing in the gap and no one is interceding for the people of God in this hour. Now, as we go through this study, I intend to show you through the power of God that God intends when he gives us the command to intercede that we do just that. He doesn't mean that we just use the word or that we just speak a lot of high sounding phrases and assume that we've done it, but rather that we allow the spirit to move through us, that the spirit can pray for those things that are needful. Amen? Praise God. So turning to Ezekiel 22 and we'll start in verse 23. And before we start, we'll pray. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for the words of life. We thank you that you are life. We thank you that we can partake of that. We just pray today that as we study your word, that it would be quickened unto us and that we'll come out of this more equipped for the battle and that we'll use the weapons that you give us for your glory and for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Praise God. Okay, we'll start in verse 23 and we'll go down through 21, uh, 31 of chapter 22, Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Sounds like the Lord's prophesying to the American church. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. People, if we are being preached a false gospel, someone is devouring our souls. If we are being told to worship the gods of materialism and the gods of idolatry of human beings and stars, we are having our souls devoured. And there is a conspiracy in the land in this day, and not just in this land, but in many lands of demonic forces. And those demonic forces are operating through the prophets and through the priesthood and souls are being devoured and souls are being taken to hell because they're not being told to turn from their wicked ways and walk in the paths of righteousness, but they're being told that they can continue in sin and be acceptable to God. That is a lie. And if you are sitting under a teaching today that tells you that sin is all right, that compromise is all right, that idolatry is acceptable, and that materialism is godly, you are being devoured, and your soul will end up in hell unequivocally because God does not change his standard to please man, and God does not turn around and bow to the whims of carnal man, and God does not bow to idols, but God stands for righteousness because he is righteousness. And God will demand a standard of holiness and righteousness out of his people. He always has and he always will, whether we like it or whether we dislike it. God does not change. Amen? Praise God. And God is saying in this word here that there is a conspiracy amongst the prophets and that souls are being devoured. And God is saying the same thing in this hour. There is a conspiracy among the prophets and souls are being devoured. Souls are being consumed. They're being eaten up by the devil and they're being taken to hell under the guise of Christianity. 
But God in this hour is ripping off the mask of the harlot church and he's exposing her for what she is and he's proclaiming her evil deeds and he's raising up a voice in this land and he's raising up a voice throughout the world that's going to declare the works of righteousness declare the works of holiness and unmask the idolatry and the harlotry of the system that co proclaims that it's Christianity and God is going to leave the horse stripped of her trappings and he's going to leave her in the multitude of her sins and he's going to expose her for the devourer of human souls that she is praise God goes forward and it says they have taken the treasure and the precious things and they have made her many widows in the midst thereof in other words these devouring prophets these false prophets these ones that are destroying the souls of men have gone and they've taken the precious things of God and they've left God's people without a husband they've left God's people as widows a widow is a woman that was married that now has no husband that now has no covering that now has no protector and that is exactly what the false prophets do to the people of God they take them and they separate them away from the living God they separate them from the God of mercy who is their protector who is their provider who is their covering who is their Lord who is their master who is their husband and they leave God's people as widows and it says her priests have violated my law and they profane my holy things and they have put no difference between the holy and the profane and neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and they have hid their eyes from my Sabbath and I am profane among them in other words the priests have thought they were higher than God they thought that they were law unto themselves because God says here they violated my law then he goes on and says they profaned my holy things they've taken the things that were righteous that were true that were pure that were undefiled and they profaned those things and they brought them down to the level of carnality and they've taken spiritual truth and they turned them into a carnal sideshow and they've made a mockery of the things of God and they've used the principles of God to make their gain. They profane the holy thing. And he says that they've put no difference between the holy and the profane. They've not said, be a separated people. They've not said, come out from among them. But they said, fellowship with the world. They said, partake of the sins of Egypt. They said, live in idolatry, live in harlotry, live in every imaginable kind of sin and still say you're serving the living God. In other words, they've taken the holy and they've taken the profane and they've mixed them together. Then it goes on and it says, neither they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and they've hid their eyes from my Sabbath and I am profaned among them. Then it says, your princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain that is the sea that's transpiring being exposed by the worldly media in the house of the harlot in this hour you see them as a bunch of ravening wolves tearing at one another's throats you see them seeking to devour the prey you see them set up as princes ruling and reigning and destroying and it says they shed blood in other words they kill the children of God they murder those who are God's heritage and it says they destroy souls God doesn't say they uplift my people and they point my people to the way and they show my people where I am and they show my people who I am but it says they destroy souls you may as well go out and go sit in a satanic church as to sit into some of these idolatrous, harlotrous churches that are proclaiming themselves to be Christians because I'll tell you the same thing is going to transpire if you sit under a satanist church and you sit under a false church you're both going to end up in hell irregardless of the way because these messengers are sent from the pit of hell and although they may not be dressed in all black and although they may not be offering up things in shed in literal blood of animals as witchcraft rituals do they're still offering God's people up to hell because it says they devour souls because they teach God's people's lies and they lead God's people away from God 
and good people are destroyed by those that are supposed to be leading them, by those that are supposed to be guiding them, by those that are supposed to be protecting them and caring for their souls. And all the time they're devouring them. They're sent from the pits of hell. They're sent from the evil one. And they're posing themselves to be messengers of God. Then it goes on and it says, to get this honest gain. This is my kingdom. I spent eight billion trillion dollars last year. This is my kingdom. I brought in 40 billion dollars last year. This is my kingdom. I've got more buildings than anyone. This honest gain. If you give to this work, God will bless you. If you give to this ministry, God will bless you. If you give to that ministry, your soul will end up in hell because you're eating deceitful meat. Amen? It's true. The land is full of abominations. The land is full of harlotry. The land is full of filthiness and fornication. And the land is full of false prophets proclaiming lies. And all for dishonest gain. All that they can strut around and wear their diamonds and wear their suspenders and ride their Mercedes Benz and their Cadillac cars and live in their lavish mansions and treat themselves as kings in this earth and wear their five pounds of makeup and their snake necklaces and claim that they are the prophets of God. They are not the prophets of God. They are the prophets of the evil one. They are the prophets of the destroyer. When there's no fruit of repentance, when there's no no seed of brokenness in a people, when a people are all covetous, when they're all committing abominable sexual sins, you cannot tell me that those are true prophets. It says, try them and know them by their fruits. And when the fruits are rotten to the core, know that it is an abomination in the nostrils of God. And know that the devil is a cunning, crafty deceiver. And know that he set up his puppets in this hour to pull the final act before the curtain comes down. And that's what it's all turned into. It's turned into one big dramatic act. It's turned into a soap opera melodrama. It's turned into an abominable thing in the sight of God. It's turned into a sideshow, a carnival, a circus. It's worse than a hot novel. It's worse than a soap opera. And every day it intensifies. And every day more sins are brought out of the closet. And every day people look to that and they say, is that the kingdom of God? No! That is not the kingdom of God, that is the kingdom of Satan. And those people are sent to devour souls. And I've heard enough of this stuff, oh, don't judge them, don't judge them. Leave it up to God to judge them. God has already judged them by his word. He says, be ye righteous and sin not. He doesn't say, wallow in sin, live in sin, cover yourself in sin, and claim that you're my vessel. He doesn't say, covetous covetously grasp and clutch and greedily devour the treasures of my people for your own gain. God does not say that at all. God says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't say, build yourself a fat recreation center where that you can indulge yourself in a wasted life of whorish mannerism. God wants us separated in a holy people. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. Yea, brother, God will restore you and even tenfold now that you have sinned and publicly let everyone see you're a whoremonger and a homosexual. Yea, brother, God will bless you. You hear that? That's the kind of prophecies that are going forth in the land today. Yea, brother, God will restore you and even tenfold now that you have sinned and publicly let everyone see you're a whoremonger and a homosexual. Yea, brother, God will bless you. You hear that? 
That's the kind of prophecies that are going forth in the land today. It says of the harlot's prophets, it says, her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. In other words, they call up and they said, oh, you're just wonderful. Let me put you back together again. Mortar is something that holds bricks together. And these kings in this earth of the kingdom of hell who are claiming that they are God's messengers have been stuck together by the false prophets and the sticking stuff is untempered mortar. They're not God's building. They're not God's handiwork. They're not God's blocks put together by tempered mortar. But they're stuck together. The man-made brick stuck together with untempered mortar. Seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. Saying, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not, 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 Spoken. Spoken. So much of this goes on, it's sickening. You go to a meeting. Yea, my little children, continue in the way that you are going. For I, the Lord thy God, will bless thee, and I will prosper thee, and I will re-bless thee, and I will increase everything about thee, because you are so sweet to me. That's a lie. Never do you hear. Yea, my little child, you are walking in abominations, and you are walking in degradations, and you are a stench into my nostrils. But that's what God's people need to hear in this hour, because God's people are covered in filthiness, and God's people are covered in abominations, and God's people have strayed from the living God, and God's people have wandered after everything. And God's people have burned incense on every hill and on every mountain. And they've offered everything up unto their multitude of idols. They've offered even their children upon the, upon the marvelous proclaimed altar of sexual freedom. They murder their children. Before their children are even brought forth from the womb, they're murdered. So that they can continue in their sexual promiscuity and in their liberation and in their freedom. And in Christian circles, abortion is acceptable and it's permitted. And singles groups are taught on their sexual liberation. And everybody bows down to the God of sex. And they commit murder in order to continue to worship this mighty false God. And then what about the God of greed and covetousness? that sweeps our nation where everybody's got to have everything material to prove they're Christian. Mothers no longer even care about their kids because they're too busy working. Dads are gone all the time. Stick the brats in front of the TV. We got to get more money. We got to work two jobs, three jobs to show people we're blessed. We got to have payments every day. We got to have payments we got to make. Every day we got to have new credit cards. Every day we got to consume something else to show people we're blessed. Blessed by what? By an idol. An idol of material gain. God never said, come at the things of this life. They didn't have stately buildings. They didn't have paid evangelists. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have organization. They didn't, couldn't get on TV and beg. But I'll tell you what they did. They turned the world upside down. Things of this life. God never said, wander around and see what you can buy. And see what you can sacrifice to gain that's going to rust. And going to be eaten away by moths. And going to be corrupted by dust. He never said that. He said, seek for the things that are eternal. Seek for the things that will last. And yet God's people go a-whoring after this false God that's been presented to them. The God of materialism. I think again of a statement Dr. Tozer made to me once. He said, Len, you know what? He said, we'll hardly get our feet out of time into eternity and gaze on eternity before what we bow our heads in shame and humiliation and say, my God, Look at all the riches there were in Jesus Christ. And I've come to the judgment seat almost a pauper. If you've got an $8 million church, 
it proves God blessed you. If you've got an $8 million church, it proves you did some dishonest gain around the way. And it proves you took God's people for a ride. And it proves you didn't heed the cries of the Christless millions who are going into hell daily because nobody's come to tell them about Jesus. But if there are a million roads into hell, there's not one road out. That if they continually sing in heaven, worthy is the Lamb, in hell, the only thing they sing is the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. And nobody sacrificed enough to even send them a piece of literature that they could read for themselves, that their souls might be redeemed, because we're too busy bowing down to a false god. A god that says if we have a big gold cross and a steeple and a 40-foot mirror in our bathroom, that we're serving God. That's a lie. God never said build up lavish temples. But he said we were to be the church. We're to be living stones. We're to be living epistles. To be seen and to be heard of all men. And oh God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. I don't know anybody else that ever prayed it. Maybe we said it. But you know, if God should stamp eternity or even judgment on our eyeballs or if you like, on the fleshy table of our hearts, I'm quite convinced we'd be a very, very different tribe of people, God's people in the world today. I would hate to think that somebody would read a living epistle that said, clutch and grasp and greed and covet and gain for yourself. And they'd say, that's Christianity. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Let me remain a Muslim. Or let me be a Buddha. Or let me be a Hindu. Good God, that's Christianity. Let me tell you something. The false religions of the world have more aesthetic value in this hour than Christians, so-called. The Muslims fast, the Muslims pray, the Muslims seek Allah three times a day, irregardless of who's around. Right here in good old USA, I have seen Muslims come into the hospital, lay out their prayer rug, and pray to Allah irregardless of who heard them. Irregardless of who was around. Irregardless of who thought they were educated, who thought they were distinguished, and who thought those people were dumb. They did it anyway. They paid homage to their God. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. I've seen Hindus in India walk for miles, living on a starvation diet, seeking a vision from their God, seeking to be right with their God. I've seen a Buddhist temple where they spent countless hours in Nepal in a consecrated life, worshiping Buddha day in and day out and calling upon him and chanting to him denial and all of those things for idols and christians you mentioned fasting you mentioned denial you mentioned sacrifice and they say you're harsh you're hard you're unloving and i'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Well, the truth of the matter is, you're backslid and you're lazy and you're compromising. Amen. Hallelujah. When I was talking with Dr. Tozer, as we used to talk together so often, he said to me one day, you know, Len, I, I'm not really too worried about what I've done. I'm not too worried about the, the judgment even on my Christian life, which I'll have, I know. But he says, he said, it's the, it's the things I could have done that worry me. The things that I missed. We're not going to be judged just because of what we've done. We're going to be judged for why we did it. Not for the action, for the motive. What motivated your giving? So you, you'd have a plaque with your name on? Or you'd be at the top of the list for giving money? Why? 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 What's the motive behind it? Saying, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery. If you don't send your money in, this work can't go on. You'll be responsible for the collapse of my prayer tower, liar. If your prayer tower collapses, it's because it was not built on the rock. Amen? 
And if your hospital closes down, it's because it wasn't ordained of God to begin with. And if your Mickey Mouse comedy show is put off the air because you won't pay your debts, then maybe it didn't need to be on the air anyway because it was ordained by the prince of the power of the air, the devil. Verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. Now come on, you folk that preach prosperity. If prosperity is God, God's order, why does he rebuke this, this, this country, this, this church? Why doesn't he compliment them and say, you're living exactly where I want you to live? And have vexed the poor and needy. Oh, let's get this QRL club all around the world. QRL partner! QRL partner! QRL partner! And let's show ourselves in all our lavish apparel to the poor. Let's go down into Brazil and show them how elegantly we look and how lavish our costumes are and how we can sing Take while they sit there in the midst of poverty in the midst of disease in the midst of sickness in the midst of depression and demon vexation are you prepared to take, challenge demon power and say, listen, I've moved into the place where the Apostle Paul was when he said, I glory in tribulation, in necessities, in reproaches. Because if you're going to get mature in God, all the dwarfs around you will criticize and sneer at you. And say you're trying to be holier than the rest of us, huh? And let's flaunt what we have. And show them how rich the American church is. And when they write in and ask us for a Bible, let's throw their letter in the garbage. And I'm embarrassed. Because it didn't have a contribution enclosed. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Oppress, vex, rob, the full stature of Satan being shown forth. Kill, steal, and destroy. Amen? Kill, steal, and destroy. And what are these false prophets doing? What are they doing? Are they giving food unto God's people? Sure they're giving them food. They're giving them rotted pottage to kill them. To give them worms and parasites. Do you know why we have so many pygmies in our pews? Because we have so many puppets in our pulpits. If Jesus came back, he wouldn't cleanse the temple, he cleansed the pulpit. It says oppression, exercise robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Even here in America, you've got some poor old widower sitting in front of a television, hoping to receive comfort in his solitude and in his loneliness. His wife of 30 years has passed away. He begins to think, is there a God really? All these years I've worked, and all these years I've brought up my family, and all these years I supported my wife. You know, I'm going to die soon, too. She's gone now. And he begins to wonder, is there a God? And some slick Joe comes on the television. Sunday morning special. Diamond rings glittering. Lights flashing just right. Makeup on an inch thick. And there's the poor old widower. widower. We'll call him Harold. And Harold is there. And inside, Harold's soul is pleading and agonizing and begging for a reality. And he's seeking the company. And he's seeking someone to take his wife's place. Not because he wants a woman, but because he's lonely. Because he's hurting. Because he wonders, is there reason? And on comes the king with the diamond rings and the lights. And immediately, the king demands money. And immediately, the king oppresses Harold and heaps condemnation upon him and tells him the work of God will not go on if he doesn't sacrifice. And Harold sits there and shakes his head. And tears roll from his eyes, but nobody tells him about Jesus Christ. And nobody tells him about the Comforter. And nobody tells him about the man on Calvary who laid his life down. 
And nobody tells them that God cares for old men who are lonely. And nobody tells him that Jesus really does love him. But they tell him that if he doesn't write out his check, that their kingdom will collapse. And he shakes his head. And he cries a few more lonely tears and he doesn't find the voice. And the king goes on. And the show goes on. And the poor and the needy go cry for For what? So somebody can say, I'm a big somebody on this earth. So somebody can say, I built this, I built that. And I'm this and I'm that. And somebody can buy another gun and and drive another big car and live in another town, fancy house that they don't need. And stay in a five-star hotel. You know, we're overboard on laughter and happiness. There's an old saying in the world, laugh and the world laughs with you. I change it, I say laugh and the church laughs with you, but weep and you weep alone. You go so near to the heart of God, we sang it our Friday, we had a marvelous Friday night prayer meeting. I wouldn't have taken that Friday night meeting for ten thousand dollars. God came and we were broken and humiliated before him. And the old man dies without the Lord, and his heart broke, because there weren't any true messages, because there weren't any true prophets, because everyone had gone aboard. And everyone had gone after the bottle of heart. Of the Lord, I can't give him any advice. I, I think I try to impress sometimes, but <clears throat> I can't give God any advice. I, I like to see a pocket full of those gorgeous people who pray. Too much in time, we're too earthbound. We see as other men see, we think as other men think. We invest our time as the world invests it, we invest our money. We're supposed to be a different breed of people. They didn't have stately buildings, they didn't have paid evangelists, they didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have organization, they didn't, couldn't get on TV and beg, but I'll tell you what they did, they turned the world upside down. And so it goes on day after day after day. And we want to brag about our Christian TV network. And I wonder how much blood we're going to have on our hands in this country for those networks that have not ministered to the people in their wretchedness and in their loneliness and in their agony. You know, Christ brings people down that they may cry out and that they may receive Him. He doesn't bring people down that they can be oppressed and condemned and beat up by a savage devourer by someone who only cares for their own gain. The Lord Jesus Christ did not die for that. He did not die for men to build kingdoms in this earth. He did not die for people to strut around in their pompous pride. But he died to redeem men's souls. He died to redeem women's souls. He died to redeem the souls of children. He died for that. He gave his life for that. And as Christians, we can do nothing less than the same. And if we settle for that other stuff, we are being devoured and our souls are being devoured. And we will end up in hell just like the guy that's sitting in a Satanist church today. Because we are sitting under false teachings if we're going for all that. That is not of the Lord. That is a conjecture of man. And it's being instigated by Satan to devour and to destroy souls. And Harold, the poor old widower who sat there in front of that television, hoping to hear about God will end up in hell, and he'll turn around, he'll point at the preacher with the diamond. And he'll say, you are the one. Because when I was ready, you fed me garbage when I wanted gold. You fed me trash when I wanted Jesus. And you know whose hands that blood is going to be on for Harold's life? It's going to be on the preacher with all the diamonds. And the diamonds aren't going to do him one bit of good when the blood covers his hands. It's about time we sobered up in the body of Christ. It's about time that we look things at things the way they are because God proclaims things the way they are. You study the Bible, you study the Word of God, God never put on a false face. God never worried if he was in tune with the brethren. God never worried if everyone saw eye to eye with what he was saying. 
But God told it like it was, and God has always had prophets to tell it like it was, and God will always have prophets to tell it like it is. And you know, one of the greatest falsities that we have accepted in modern Christianity is the need for fellowship among the brethren. When the charismatic renewal started and God, God I hope it was God was moving, and people from all kinds of denominations were finding out that they could have the Holy Ghost, and the Protestant circles enlarged their borders and lifted their skirts to embrace Catholicism and to take in all the harlotries of the mistress, mistress of whores, the Roman Catholic Church, and the little sisters learned her tricks. One of the greatest tricks that was brought in by the devil was that all must see eye to eye, and that all must be moving in the same direction, and that all brethren, so-called, in the body of Christ must embrace one another. Well, I've got news for you. If you're full of harlotry and whoredoms and you're continuing in sin, I'm not going to embrace you. And I don't care what kind of name or what kind of label or what kind of title you want to throw at me, I am not going to embrace that. You're not going to transfer those demons onto me. And the biggest mistake that has been made, and I hear it all the time, you go to any conference and you hear people preaching against what they call lone language. They say God does not have Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger, uh, for those of you that don't know the history, Lone Ranger was a television idol in the early 50s and 60s in the United States of America. And he was a man who did noble deeds, but he didn't ride with the rest of the crew. In other words, he was not a part of the corporate body, but he was called aside. And they say God does not have Lone Ranger. If God does not have Lone Rangers, where did Ezekiel come from? Where did Jeremiah come from? Where did Isaiah come from? Where did Hosea come from? Where did Obadiah come from? Where did Amos come from? Where did Jonah come from? Who were those men? I don't read where they went to leadership conferences and found out what all the brethren were saying before they could poke home the word of the Lord. I don't read that at all. I've never found that in the Bible. I've been looking for it. I've been trying to find where God said, Yea, prophets, come unto me, and we shall have a leadership conference, and you shall exchange truth one with another, and then you shall proclaim my word. The Bible doesn't say that. That is not scriptural. That is not biblical. That is man. That is man's imagination. That is man's attempt at unity. People, unity does not come by covering sin. Unity does not come by calling a lie the truth. But unity can only come as we stand for the righteousness and the holiness of God. Because if we do not have unity with God, we are not going to have unity with anyone. And I've heard this teaching, I've heard this proclamation, and every time I've looked at it and I've said, okay, show me the fruit of it, I see a bunch of brethren who are talking one against the other while they're proclaiming the seed eye to eye. If they were seeing eye to eye, they wouldn't have to be undermining one another's ministry. They would all be in the focal agreement of unity with God. If we get off track and we lose unity with God, there is absolutely no way we can have unity with our brethren. There's no way because God is the focal point. If I turn from God, I cannot be in union with you. And if you turn from God, you cannot be in union with me because it's God Almighty that holds the body of Christ together. And when man tries to build the body of Christ, he makes a mess. He tries to put it together with untempered mortar. Now we're going on here, and we're going to see that God fought for a lone ranger. And it says, that they vex the poor and the needy, and yet they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Then he says in verse 30, now listen to this very, very, very carefully. He says, I sought for a man among them. He does not say, I sought for a fellowship group. He does not say, I sought for a body of brethren who were moving together. He does not say, I sought for a conference of leaders or a seminar. He says, I sought for a man. 
God was looking for a Lone Ranger. Hallelujah! God was looking for somebody He could call out to you. That He could say, be mine, stand for me. He says, I sought for a man among them. In other words, they were all so backslid that God had to seek. It was nobody that said, here I am, God, use me. God had to seek for somebody. Would you come? Michael, would you come? Rudy, would you come? Nathaniel, would you come? Christopher, would you come? Would anybody come? God's saying, I'm looking for somebody. Now, if these people weren't backslid, if they weren't in abominable shape before God, if they weren't in a in a condition of total idolatry, in harlotry, God would not have had to go seeking. Because there would have been five or ten or fifty that said, Here I am, God, use me. I will stand in the gap. I am available. When your heart is right with God, you are available. When your heart is far from God, you are hardened against the works of God and against the heart of God and against the desires of God. You know, this thing that's being passed off as Christianity is stone-hearted religion. Did you hear me? It's stone-hearted religion because God is a heart of compassion. God is a heart of mercy and God is a heart of righteousness and holiness. And this fake face imitation, this bigamous fool, this promoting itself as the church of Jesus Christ is a lie. It's a stone-hearted, man-made religion. And it is not the living God. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. See? You see the condition of the body in that day? Do you see the condition of the body in this day? God said, I'm going to destroy this wretched, harlotrous, adulterous, sin-sick, fornicating thing that's calling itself my body. God said that. Then he says, but I'm going to seek and if there's even one man that'll stand in the gap, if there's even one man that'll be the Lone Ranger, if there's even one man that'll stand up and proclaim the truth and boldness, he said, I won't destroy it. But then he said, I didn't find anybody. They were all at the leadership conference. They were all at the minister's meeting. They were all at the prayer breakfast. Mm -mm -mm. They were all getting their vision changed so they could see eye to eye. God couldn't find anybody to stand with him. They were too busy standing with each other. Did you, Did hear, you that? hear that? They were they too busy fellowshipping. They were too busy fornicating with the things of this world to stand for God. God said, I couldn't find anybody. Then it goes on, it says, Therefore, have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. So in essence, what the Lord is saying there is, I sought for a Lone Ranger, I sought for somebody to stand in the gap, I sought for somebody that would stand with me and I couldn't find anybody. And that is the deceit that I'm unmasking today in this particular uh, revelation from the pit of hell, that everybody's got to move together, that everybody's got to see eye to eye, that all brethren got to rub the same way, that everybody's got to fornicate with the world in order to be in what God is doing in this hour. That is an abominable lie, that is a hypocrisy, that is from the pit of hell, and that is the words of Satan himself. Because God said, I looked, I sought, I searched for somebody that would stand in the gap, for somebody that would stand up for me, for somebody that would stand in the place of righteousness and holiness and truth, and I couldn't find anybody, therefore I'm going to destroy the whole mess, 
and that is the place that the body of Christ in this nation is coming to in this hour because it's been the harlot on God. It's played the whore with everything imaginable and God is searching and God is seeking and God is saying, would you stand for me? And men are shaking their heads and they're saying, no, I won't stand for you because if I stand for you, I won't be accepted by the brethren and the day is going to come unless there's a people that are raised up. The day is going to come when Almighty God is going to say, okay, I'm going to heap my indignation and my wrath upon you and the works that you've committed in my sight are going to come down on your head. God is searching and God is calling for intercessors. And intercessors are not going to be people that stand up and say, pray for our nation and then go out and commit the fornication and the idolatry and the adultery of this nation. So go ahead, you're on the air with Pastor Cole. This topic is very important to me right now. My son is a little bit confused. My husband has left home and has moved in with another woman. And I'm trying to show my son that my husband is living in sin. Is he a professed believer, your husband? Yes, sir. But some people are telling my children, once saved, always saved. And I'm trying to make my son realize that his father is living in sin. And until he repents, that he won't be on his way to heaven. Well, if he was a genuine believer before he moved in with this other woman, then he is indeed on the way to heaven, and he will never get off the road to heaven. That is not an intercessor. I'm sorry to tell you, but we have a misunderstanding about what intercession is. Intercession doesn't mean that you go lay with the harlot and then promote yourself to God. Or that you lay with the harlot and then say, God, redeem her. The intercessor is separated unto God. There's so many books and so many phrases and so many terminologies in this hour referring to intercession and you pick them up and you read them and you listen to tapes about it and it's all garbage. Because nobody's standing up for the righteousness of God. They're saying, oh, let's intercede for our nation. And they're committing every abomination that the nation is guilty of. People, if we're going to intercede, we're going to stand in the gap. We're going to stand with God. When you study what this word intercession actually means, it means that you act between parties that are of opposing views to bring them to a reconciliation. We've already learned today that God is not going to come and bow down to man. God is not going to come to you and your whoredoms and say, Oh, my son, I worship you so much that I will accept you in any kind of filth you want to present to me. Or, yea, my daughter, your harlotries are so beguiling and so clever that I just think that I will embrace them so you won't get upset. God's not going to do that. God has always had a standard. God has always required a holy and a separated people. Amen? God is doing the same thing in this hour. And when we intercede, that means we stand with God. I mean, it is so sickening. You go to a conference. You go to a meeting. And they're standing up there saying, intercede, intercede, intercede. Nobody's standing for God. You know what that intercession intercession does? It falls on deaf ears. God doesn't hear it. If we don't stand for God, God doesn't stand for us. I can, if you're in sin, I can say to God all day long, I'm interceding for Sister Susie's soul. But then when Sister Susie invites me over for a cocktail, and I go, and I have a cocktail, I'm no longer interceding for Sister Susie's soul. I'm committing the same sins that she's into. So I've changed sides. And God's not going to hear my prayer. I don't care if I spend six hours on my knees so I'm interceding for Sister Susie's soul. If I'm not standing with God, I'm not in intercession. Amen? Now intercession is a mighty weapon. God said, I'm looking for anybody that'll intercede for my people. Anybody that'll stand in the gap. Anybody that'll reconcile my people unto me. It is not God's pleasure to destroy his people. But God in his wrath and in his indignation will destroy them if they refuse to turn from their wicked ways. And God is saying in this chapter, 
He'd say, I looked and I looked and I looked and I saw it and I saw it and I couldn't find anybody. So now I'm going to just have to do away with them. But it wasn't God's desire to do away with them. It was God's desire that a mediator be raised up that could reconcile his people to him. We are not going to reconcile God's people to God by telling them sin is okay. We're not going to reconcile God's people to God by telling them compromise, commit adultery, commit fornication, do whatever you want to do, lust after this, long after that, covet after this, grieve for that. We're not going to reconcile God's people to God by telling him to tell lies and hypocrisy. We're going to reconcile God's people to God by preaching the truth in love. And everybody thinks that love means rubbing your back at some kind of a meeting. That's not love. Love is telling you when you're in error. Love is telling you when you're walking in unrighteousness, in uncleanness, and when you're displeasing God. If I love you, I'm going to do my best to make you presentable to God. But if I want to devour your soul, I'm going to lie to you and I'm going to rub your back and tell you how much I love you. But if I've destroyed your soul and if I've devoured you, and if I've led you astray from God's inheritance, I don't love you. I hate you. Help us, we're dead. But if I stood up to you to your face and I told you, you're wrong. You're walking in rebellion. You're walking in idolatry. You're departed from God. And you listen to what I've got to say and you repent and you turn from your wicked ways. Even though what I said to you might have sounded harsh and judgmental to your flesh. What I said to you was life to your spirit because it reconciles you unto the living God and it sets you back in the path of righteousness and it puts your feet on the highway of holiness and it puts you back in the favor and in the presence of the living and the righteous judge of all mankind. Amen? Hallelujah! Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity.